Okay. Good to see you again, Alex. And um, we're working on uh, not working on thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> in, in the sense that in the beginning of practice, the thoughts, like always, have been important that we have attached important. to thoughts in the thinking that my thoughts are important when what I have to think is important things that need to be done. Mm -hmm. An example of the, that would be like, I've got to back up that hard disk. And so I do, you know, all of the consternations about, well, what have I got to go do to get the backup and where is this and that kind of other thing. But really, if I don't make that backup, it's okay. Yeah, I don't have to do that. Yep, that's right. That's right. I don't have to. I don't have to give. I don't have to create that insurance. You know, the, it, it was a lot of insurance policies in the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. Congratulations, success. Oh wait, wait, wait. I really got to make sure it's gone. I really got to mm -hmm. make sure I took care of the duca. You know, that build insurance policies. Now, I'm not building insurance policies. I'm just writing checks. <laughs> mm. Okay. Right. That's another way of putting it. And one time, in fact, it was Dan himself that one time says is that um, uh, I, I asked him to do something. He said he'll have to make time. And I says, I've never made any. <laughs> All I've ever done was spend it. <laughs> that's what you said? Or that's what yeah, Dan, I, Danny said? Oh, well, yeah. No, Dan said he had to make time. And I says, I've never made any. <laughs> I don't even know how to make time. That's another thing, by the way, the experience of time seems to be shifting as well. One is I'm just not thinking about time in general, I'm not thinking about these things that traditionally like or ordinarily humans think about. Um, when I go outside, I went outside today and a truck went by me and it literally felt as though the truck was in my body almost so to speak in my actual, I could locate the truck in my senses rather than mm -hmm. being over there. Right. Well, that rumbling that trucks do out on the highway is a vibration. And when you are close to the truck, when it rolls by and rumbles by, your body will rumble in sympathetic vibration to the it truck. It was so pleasant though. The truck. Yeah, it was amazing though. Like that's never happened. Well, well, it ha well, what had happened, though, is that you were aware of how everything is interrelated and how you were affected. Mm -hmm. In fact, when the truck comes by, you are the truck mm -hmm. because you're thinking about the truck. You're feeling the truck mm -hmm. on the inside. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so in that moment, you were not Alex, you were a truck. Yep. Yep. Now the truck. And so the, the vibrations of the truck were, were in the, uh, let us say, vicinity. And you were in the vicinity. And so the vibrations were within you because you were in the vicinity of those vibrations. Mm. Mm -hmm. This is an interconnection that we have. We are interconnected with everything. But when yeah. we are thinking, our thoughts are important then that's uh, that's just kind of a separation from reality because thoughts are not real. Mm -hmm. But the rumbling of that truck was real. Mm -hmm. Feel it. OK, so in that regard, we're going from that the thoughts are real into that they become less and less real. Mm -hmm. So that there's there's basically nothing to it. And a lot of students have a lot of trouble with that issue of right effort of, oh, it's hard to change the patterns of the mind. It's hard to change it from uh, what I was doing, that I really do hate Aunt Susie, and I want to hate Aunt Susie, and I'm going to think about hating Aunt Susie, and I don't even want to stop thinking about hating Aunt Susie. And in that regard, those kind of thoughts and attitude are hard to change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But when we begin yeah. first off to, to see the danger in having those thoughts of hating Aunt Susie, yes. we begin to let go of them. We can yes. escape from them. Not even well, go, after a, yeah. 
So after a whole lot of practice, we begin to recognize that, hey, none of the thoughts were really all of that important. Yeah. None of the thoughts really gave me the gratification that I had expected from them. Mm -hmm. That's one of the reasons why we keep having the same thought patterns over and over and over and over again is because we're kind of expecting something new to happen. Mm -hmm. Right? If I finally get it done, right? Uh, but the reality is, is that uh, getting into those habits, just grind it in and make it worse. Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa had said once when I asked him, of, uh, because uh, I was talking about practicing meditation and looking at it from the example of if at first you don't succeed, try, try again, like coming back and keep coming back and keep coming back. And he was taking it from the preference of, no, if at first you don't succeed, look at what you're doing. Look at what you're doing. Yeah. Because you did to see, succeed. You thought it was failure, but in fact, it was a success because the success is seeing the failure. That's the success is seeing yeah. the failure. Ignoring yeah. the failure or lying about the failure or not recognizing the failure. That's real failure. Mm. Interesting, because when someone shared that quote with me on the Sangha, I think it was Scott, actually. Scott told me that quote. I said, um, I had an unwholesome thought a minute later or something, and I was like, oh, congratulations. But what I noticed is there, Domorado, sometimes, is that like little berater in the back of the head, or a little berater in the back of that voice. It's like, you know, the unwholesome thought is the driver. They're in the driver's seat, and the berater is like the backseat driver, like, no, you can't congratulate that. No, that's not a success. And in that moment, when I saw that, I stopped and I looked at what I was doing. And what I noticed is that that berater is there because I don't give myself full permission to actually feel the success. The berater is disguised as, you know, like you, sh you can't feel successful, whatever. But what that is at the root is you don't deserve it. I, you don't have permission as if there's some kind of imaginary authoritarian figure giving me permission to congratulate myself and really truly feel success from what right. I saw at one time that a raider was real was real yeah okay, that you did go through a, at one time or perhaps over a period of a long time it could have been a uh, a music teacher it could have been um an uncle. It could have been your own mom. It could have been an older, an older sibling or a bully. But somewhere along the line, someone was berating you. And when you first started calling me, that berater was driving. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah, that berater was driving. Good point. Good point. <laughs> Good point. Yeah. And now you've got right. him in the back seat. That's right. That's right. And and now it's going in the trunk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. So that's the way of thinking of it is, is that, yes, that the raider is there. And and um, the job is, is to recognize that the raider, which is another word, is the critical mind that you have been taught to be critical of everything yeah. that in fact in that regard you could say that the whole society has been berating you mm -hmm. that it's kind of felt like that that you got yep. to cover all the bases because uh the berater is going to likely come in in any form from any direction in anybody's skin mm. and you got to be ready for it because they're going to whop you mm -hmm. All right. And so that um, that kind of vigil or on guard is actually. Surprisingly enough, going to be of value to you, because that was the skill itself that you had developed. Of trying to be careful to avoid the berater. Now you can turn that skill back on the berater and be very, very wary. Of the berater himself coming into contact with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, because you've already got him in the back seat now. Yeah. 
that's that's uh, uh, showing that, that improvement that you're beginning to see that stuff. Yeah. And that as we do, we begin to recognize I don't have to pay attention to that. Yes. That I, I can get my permission from someplace else. Yes. And that is what I was going to say to you when I took that advice of look at what I'm doing. In the moment I saw that I wasn't giving myself permission, or that's what the berator was, not giving me permission, I saw through it and I was like, I don't have to listen to that anymore. I actually, what I did is it was the spirit of experimentation. I was like, you know what? For this one, I'm not going to pay attention to that berator. I'm just going to congratulate myself and see how I feel right here. And I noticed that I felt just as good as I did when I was seeing the berator. So I was like, okay. I guess I don't need to pay attention to it anymore. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. You know, you said in the beginning that this is like a placebo. The whole Dhamma is a placebo. Mm -hmm. I'm really starting to see that. Like in the beginning, I thought there were all these rules to it, right? But as we go through the Anapanasati, it seems as though you have to kind of, you have to look at everything very carefully and notice, I can take that one away. I could take that one away. I don't have to do that anymore. I don't have to do that anymore. You're getting yourself familiar with the territory of that, of the wholesome. And then you can see like, I don't need to keep anything up anymore. I'm okay. Everything's fine. And in fact, keeping it up, in fact, a, a large part of An An Anapanasati is seeing your dukkha. Anapanasati in some sense is kind of dukkha actually. Like it, it, it helps you get out of it. But what I've been seeing is like the more and more I need to do something, the more and more I need to do the Anapanasati practice, that's dukkha. It's like, no, mm -hmm. I'm just going to chill out. I'm okay. I'm just going to rest right here. Funny as... that Dan and I have both been telling you that from the very beginning. <laughs> <laughs> and, it's true. And it finally dawned on you. Yes. That finally you, dawned uh, on me. It finally dawned on me. So many times he would be like, oh, just forget about it. Drop it. And I and I would just be like, no, no, no. For the past two years, you'd be saying things like this, and I just did never get it. But I would say that the the going into my feelings and accepting my feelings for the past two years prepared me to meet with you, because what mm -hmm. we're doing is we're cutting the root the root of the the root off, which is the thought, right? Well, if, we're gonna let the root wither because we're just cutting leaves. We're just, you know, we're just hedge trimmers. We're, right. We are not right. ditch diggers. <laughs> right. We're just okay. Yeah, we're just cutting leaves exactly, and letting it, the rest take care of itself. Right. One leaf at a time. Because if you do not have any energy for those thoughts, we don't dwell on them. We're not yes. repeating them. We don't build that habit up. If every time that thought comes up, we throw it out and give ourselves a better thought then that will be the thought that builds the new habit. Yes. Yes. So anything that we repeat over and over and over again will become a habit. And anything that we stop repeating over and over again will die out. Yeah. OK, as excellent as I was at whatever level of the piano that I was, I cannot play any of that stuff anymore. Maybe chopsticks. Oh, wow. Mm. I had a similar experience play, with them. playing Chopin. Not a chance. Oh wow! Hmm. I could remember the song in my head, but the thing of it is, is what would be the first note? What first finger goes on what first note? <laughs> <laughs> and I don't remember. <laughs> like Moonlight Sonata, I can't play it. I don't even know where to start. I know what key's been intellectually, so that means that probably the first note's going to be so sharp minor. But after that, I, I mean, I can hear the thing in my head, but going and playing it, and I had it memorized. I could play that thing, you know, probably on two different pianos. I never had that opportunity, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I had that first movement down. It was the third movement. I mean, the, the second movement is also easy enough. It's it's lilting and slow and whatnot like that. But that third um, uh, movement of that uh, sonata literally looks like somebody's trying to destroy that piano with his fingernail. <laughs> oh my God. I have seen piano players. It's pretty, it's pretty, um, yeah, 
it's it's something. <clears throat> and so yeah, um, I can hear that third moving in my head, but mm. I can't, can't play it. Can't play it. Uh, but because the first movement was so much simple, and that's the one that everybody knows so much about, um, that one was really deeply ingrained. Mm. But I haven't played it in 40 years, and I just simply don't even know where to start now. Hmm. Probably if I had a score and a piano, I could relearn it. But why would I want to do that? <laughs> 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 I've waited so many years to be an old man. Now it's time to enjoy being an old man. Old men don't have to play. <laughs> and so this is the way in um you used originally uh early in our talk, you used the word permission. And mm. this is an important point to keep coming back to that you do have permission to not do what you used to be told that you had to do. Now you have permission. You don't have to do any of that. Mm -hmm. Even with the hardcore practice of Anapanasa, you don't mm -hmm. have to do that. You don't mm -hmm. have to. Mm -hmm. It's an easy practice. Mm -hmm. Let it, it be easy. Mm -hmm. It's it's a perceptual shift. Mm -hmm. That's that that's occurred. That's what it is. It's and and it's it's a matter of it's a matter of taking the doubt and the progress and making a concession out of the two. Like, hey, it's okay. There's a little bit of doubt in the picture, but I'm gonna go with the progress. I'm gonna listen to the evidence. I'm gonna listen to what has been happening here intuitively, I can let go of some of these things now. It can be easy. If it can be hard, it can be easy. <laughs> and if things really get screwed up, if things really go south, you can handle it then. You can handle it then. Yeah. You don't in have fact, to handle it now in case it goes yes, south. You can yes. handle it then when it does go south. Yes. You know, it's interesting. I thought about that right before we got on the phone, actually. I thought about like this new, like expansive awareness that I've that I've located myself in, basically. And I don't want to lose it. But I thought about that and I was like, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm just going to let go. I'm going to let go. Yeah, so what if I lose it? Yeah. So trying what if I lose? Hold of, trying to keep hold of it, that's going yeah. to hurt it. <laughs> yeah. And, and in fact, there's really nothing to lose. That's, I think that's doubt. There's really nothing to lose here. That's the same thing. And so in our conversations, we have a chance to reestablish and re-recognize that everything really is okay. And that all of these feelings that we have in the body that come from the mind that says that things are not okay. Well, what is this? Or, oh no, I've got to go do that. Or any of those kind of thoughts. We can, when those come up, we can say, I can handle that when it happens. I don't have exactly. to do right handle now. that when it happens. Yeah. I don't have to get prepared. Yes, yes. Don't have to get prepared. Or already a thing. I'm already prepared. I was just gonna say, yeah, already prepared. Yeah, already. Prepared. And so somewhere in there, that berater of yours was just jumping on you on a regular basis, and so you started living your life as if everything was berating you. And um, in in a way, then if you think of it like that. That would be the classical definition of paranoia. Now, not the te not the uh, the clinical definition, but the classical definition of paranoia. Um, uh, the word para means around, hmm. 
and we have the idea that everything around us is dangerous or everything around us is plotting against us or everything around us is out to do us harm. Wow. And, and the paradigm shift, and you know that. I mean, that's your Bay Raider. Yeah. You've got to get ready because something's going to go wrong any minute now. Yeah. And we can change that attitude into the attitude that the word is metanoia, where you have the idea that your environment and everything around you is there to support you. It's there to be your friend. Well, that's what I've actually seen with this resting in space, resting in awareness. That's what I've actually seen, that in resting in awareness, there is nothing that can touch me. There is nothing that can hurt me. There is nothing that can make me feel bad. There's mm -hmm. nothing that can make me feel good. Even it, it's like it, there's no extremes in it. It's just, mm -hmm. it's just cool, baby. Uh -huh. And so when you're laying in a bed that's, uh, let us say, broken down or beat up or whatever like that, and you can recognize that the bed is getting old, you can say to the bed. Thank you so much. You've given your life in support of me all of these years. <laughs> it's been it hasn't even been one year. We're returning it. <laughs> but I can say all of these months. Yeah, yes. all of these months has <laughs> been supporting you. OK, so this is a way of thinking that thank the bed. Congratulate yourself that you don't have to be miserable because the bread, the bed has busted the spring or it's falling apart somehow. Everything falls apart. Yes. Everything yes. falls apart and it's and falling I, apart in service of supporting you. And I, I don't complain because that night last night where I only got three hours of sleep, all of that happened from not, like one not sleeping. So I'm happy about it. I have a question. Okay. <laughs> Do you? <laughs> yeah. The the Anapanasati practice, when you teach your students, is this typically where it leads to where they can just eventually be like, well. Oh, I have had so much joy watching students come out of their stuff. It has been such a pleasure. I have seen so many students here on the Zoom calls or the Skype calls making actual progress. In fact, the people who have watched your number of videos have seen you change. It's possible. I just talked to a couple this morning. Uh, the man, this is his first time that he's been with his wife on the call, and he has uh, admitted easily that he can see the changes that his wife has made. It's easy to see people do make changes because they know that they can. Mm. If you are around only unhappy people all the time, then that seems quite ordinary. But when you start dealing with people who are up and happy, it kind of rubs off. This is part of the job that I have mm. is to let this stuff rub off. Mm. That you could see it in practice rather than just as didactic information it does it it's rubbed off on my girlfriend <laughs> she's changing she's very uh she's much more playful and you know i i noticed that like if there's something that she's bummed out about i can easily like spin the narrative you know um it can be fun it can be light make levity of the situation rather mm -hmm. than buy into her misery <laughs> And then it helps her see, it helps her hold a mirror up to her face and be like, oh, look, I can smile. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> so then the furtherance of your question, um, everyone starts <clears throat> off in a combination or a mixture of trying to get it right and seeing that it's a lot of work. Everyone <laughs> starts off that way. That in fact, that's the way that meditation is generally approached. We have that idea, I guess, from the idea of the retreats. Here's something that's very unusual for most people to understand. That let us say before 1950, 
There was never in all of the Buddhist world with all the millions of monks, there was never a 10 day retreat that that was invented in Burma for government employees. Hmm. And Goenka got involved with that group because he was in business and um, uh, dealing with the, uh, in, in fact, the story is, is that the guy's name was Uba Ken. And the word U, by the way, like U thought or uh, U, that's the uh, Burmese word for uncle. Mm. So Uba Ken was, he was the minister of finance for the newly formed Burmese government when the British left in the 1950s. Okay. He was the newly, uh, he was the newly appointed what? Minister of finance. The treasurer, uh, the secretary of the treasury, those kind of words. I don't know what it would be called in Burmese, but he was in charge of all of the money and he had all of the accountants. And what was his name? Uba Ken. Uba Ken, okay. And Uba Ken was a uh, friend of Les Letty Sawadaw and also knew Mahasi Sawadaw back in the 1950s. Uh, and so he got the, the 10 day retreat put together so that the um, employees uh, working for the Treasury Department, all of the accountants or whatever, took a week off so that starting on Friday evening, taking the whole week and then finishing on Monday morning so that they go back to work. And that whole 10 day period from uh, a full week plus an extra weekend uh, was how it was uh, started. And mm. so they they did these from time to time and Goenka got involved with it. And this is also what happened with the Westerners. So this was the Westerners introduction was due to an event or a group of events that happened during the formation of the Burmese government in the 1950s. But part of the formation of that government, by the way, was is that they now wanted to expel all of the Indians because when the British um, took Burma, instead of building their own government from the ground up in Burma, they borrowed it from India and so brought a huge number, thousands of Indians in to run the government for the British in Burma. When the Burmese came, the first thing that they wanted to do was let's make this thing Burmese and deport the Indians. Goenka was deported. Hmm. He was deported from Burma, I think <clears throat> 1959, something like that was when he was deported. So the point that we're making here is, is that this heavy duty. 10 day retreat mentality. Then got introduced to the West with. Um, Joseph and Jack and a few others way back in the 1970s um, with Goenka and whatnot like that. <clears throat> and so this has become Western Buddhism. Is this heavy duty retreat mentality? Huh. And that's got nothing to do with how wants operate. That in huh. fact, Dan, Dan came to do a retreat here at Wat So and Mok. Yeah, he told me. And he got the opinion that this is the life of a monk. Mm. And I know tens of thousands of monks, not personally, but of the personal monks that I have known, maybe 200 or so, not one of them has ever done a retreat. Hmm. Huh. There are more lay people doing retreats than there are monks. Monks don't do retreats. Their own retreat all the time. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Except that they're not doing it the way in the in the organized, structured way. Mm. That in fact, the retreat has to do with the fact that you've got a whole bunch of people all trying to do a beginner's thing all at the same time. And so the Goenka retreats wind up being just beginner's retreats that once you get going into Goenka's retreats, you've got to leave Goenka because he only does beginner's retreats. Hmm. Doesn't do hmm. anything 
beginners retreats. Why did you do only beginners retreats? Because that's all you've got to, to work with at the beginning is beginners. And that's all that Goenka really had himself anyway, that he didn't stay in Burma long enough to find out what was really going on with Anapanasati. And it seems like that's the thing that's most missing in the West is the concept of Sangha, that that's the part that really makes uh, the teachings of the Buddha work, is, is that he's got Sangha around him. Um, a good example of that is in the Anapanasati Sutta, in the beginning of the Sutta, it gives the background of this talk. And it has a paragraph of nothing but names of the teachers who brought their students to this particular talk. So it's sort of like um, a, a big university, the graduation ceremony, and all the professors are sitting there with all of their uh, PhD students as the PhDs are given out, you know, by the, hmm. the head dude or maybe the president or a queen or something like that, but that all the students are collected with their representative department chair or uh, professor or whatever like that. So this is very much the same. It was a <clears throat> very, very well organized. As uh, uh, in, but it was organized not in the sense that all of those students sit in front of the teacher like in a class, but it was much more like that the, the teacher just lived out in the woods in a particular area and the students lived with him, around him. Mm. And so this is the way that it, uh, the wants wind up uh, being in existence. And so I cannot think of temple life being any possibly different from a retreat than anything else. I mean, a retreat is absolutely different from life in the watch. Mm. I do remember one time that I had signed up for one of the retreats at Watso and Moke in, 19, in 2011. And uh, when I was there, uh, Ajahn Po was it, uh, having to say, and he says, what are you doing in this retreat? You don't belong in here. Because mm -hmm. retreats are beginners. And they said, well, I actually wanted to do the retreat because I wanted to hear my friend Dhamma Vitu give talks. And that was good enough for Ajahn Po. Mm -hmm. He actually wanted to pull me out of the retreat. <laughs> for the watch. He said, you don't need this. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you were a pretty big contribution. No, not really, because I didn't go to all of the, um, uh, let us call it, required fittings. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was there for the talks. <laughs> cool. But yes, I did some uh, with the students. All, all sorts of variety. In fact, that's the thing about um, the retreats at Watso and Moog were in the beginning kind of based upon the Goenka retreats. And the reason for that was because I had come out of the Goenka retreats. I knew how to do a Goenka retreat really, really well. And so there's still that kind of an influence about how the retreats are run is because I did that. <laughs> <laughs> and if I had to do it over again, the retreats wouldn't be anything like they are. Mm -hmm. Take that hardness out of it. Mm -hmm. Make it easy, not not have so many rules. Yeah, no, you you really you really helped me out a lot, Tomorado. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it. You've you've helped me so much. I've well, totally you've done all the work. I'm just sitting here laughing. Work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you've done all the work. Yeah. But Congratulations on not doing so much of that anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what? It, you know what it's kind of like. It, I, I imagine it is like you know you're, you're painting a house, right? And I mean that just that 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 takes a good amount of time to really like paint that house, and you got to get the brush strokes right. And after a while, it gets easy to paint the house. But when you're done painting the house, you can just look at it and be like, "Oh wow, that's nice." <laughs> mm -hmm. That's kind but of you don't have is. to wait till you finish the whole house. You can just look at this section of the wall and say, yeah, that's nice. Exactly. Yeah, the section of the wall. Yeah, yeah.
Mm-hmm. So, um, is there anything else that that we're going to discuss? Or well, the last thing that I can say is is that since there is no place to go and nothing to do, the now the new task is to remain there with no yep. place to go yep. and nothing to do. The sustaining yes. of it to keep coming okay. back if you okay. go away and when you're there, just keep sustaining it Good. and let that okay. seed grow. So the so, new example is, is that within this seed is a tree and within that seed, within a hundred years, it's an entire forest. But you have to nourish the seed. You have to water the seed. You have to give it some daylight and let it grow on its own. So this yeah. seed is the seed of satisfaction. Yes. And yes. what you wanted to do was to cut that seed open to find the forest in the seed. And the, the forest is not in the seed in that way. You can't cut it open and find it right now. You have to let it grow and nourish. And so this is the stage that you're coming to now is, is that you got to keep nourishing, keep nourishing, and keep nourishing. Okay. Keep remembering to do that. that and satisfaction. Really no place should go. And and satisfaction is synonymous with that that like timeless space awareness. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. And the satisfaction will grow just like yeah. that seed will grow. Okay. Okay. Cool. And so that's it. We have to just keep practicing being okay, practicing being satisfied. And pretty soon you'll have a thought, something like, wow, I've been satisfied for the past month. (laughs) (laughs) Wow, I didn't believe I could do that. Gosh, it's been three years since I've been angry. You know, that kind of wow kind of (laughs) like this is really success. Yeah. Yeah, Okay. That's when the that's when the tree begins to plant or begins to spring fruit. Uh. There's Great. real fruit in that tree, but we have to start it off as a seed and let it grow and let it grow. And so this is the whole point is that we have to actually find satisfaction and then keep that satisfaction. Yes. To keep it growing, to keep it nourished, to keep it going, to give yourself permission to keep coming back and nourishing that plant. Even though the yeah. paraders in the back seat saying, you got nothing there. That's only a seed. Throw that damn thing out. Drive your car. <laughs> and you can say, oh, no, this is precious. I'm going to keep this. I'm going to keep it. I'm going to keep my satisfaction. And have permission to say, I don't need the parader. Don't need him anymore. He's gotten me so far. Then, in fact, you've heard us talk about uh, the Simon and Garfunkel song, uh, The Sound of Silence, Hello, Darkness, My Old Friend. So now you can begin to see this by Raider as a friend because he's gotten you. I mean, look how successful you've been your whole life. He's gotten you someplace. He's taught you some skills. So don't hate him. Just recognize that you don't need him so much anymore, that he's already done his job now. He can rest. Yeah. Old friend, he can take a rest now. Mm. So let him stay in the back seat for a while. Make friends with him. Great. Absolutely. So let's finish now, and you can go be satisfied. And I'll go talk to Johnny because he's calling. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. And the next time we talk, I'd like to ask you about parents. Okay, do that. You yeah. don't have to ask me now to Not talk now. about it next time. You can talk about okay. it next time. <laughs> if I remember. <laughs> if you don't, then it doesn't matter. <laughs> it <was laughs> doesn't matter. It. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Thank you so All much. Right. Otto. We'll see you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye.